we'll start with this. Well, reigning WBO middleweight champion Demetrius Andre caught wind of Jermall Charlo's recent comments on the heels of his decision win of Juan Montiel. Demetrius says, future of boxing is making himself look like a damn fool. He says, I'm not a matchmaker. Benavidez needs to be vaccinated. Andre's got to beat Montiel first, laughing my ass off at his excuses. At least twin Charlo, Jermel Charlo, has some balls, and he's trying to be undisputed. Jermel, let's unify in September. Hashtag, you're scared. And it's hard to look at it any other way. I mean, you try to be objective, you try to call it down the middle, and... You stick to the facts. You try to. And in sticking to the facts, there is no one else to blame for this fight between Demetrius and Jermall having not happened already. There's no one else to blame but Jermall Charlo, and, and all of the blame has to be laid at the feet of Jermall Charlo and the guys on his side of things, because he was already made an offer to come over to DAZN. They'd pay for the fight, they'd flip the bill, and he didn't want to do that. Demetrius Andre, Eddie Hearn, then offered to have Demetrius cross over to Jamal's side of things, and that proposition was shot down as well, shot down by Tom Brown, who in so many words placed more value on a Juan Montiel fight than a Demetrius Andre unification match. And I don't know who he's trying to kid. I don't know who he thinks actually feels a Juan Montiel fight is more interesting than a Demetrius Andre unification match. I mean, in one sentence, you don't want to go to them and you don't want to have them come to you. So what the hell do you want to do? You want to fight more guys like Juan Montiel? You gotta blame Jamal. There is no way you can look at this situation objectively and not come to the conclusion that Jamal Charlo and his handlers are to blame. That if anyone is at all averse to this fight happening, these two titles being unified, it's Jermall Charlo and it's the guys on his side of things because the Demetrius Andre people already offered to pay for the fight and you didn't want to let them do that. Then they offered to have you pay for the fight in your neck of the woods, on your side of things, and you didn't want to do that either. Demetrius Andre mentioned Jermall Charlo, Jermall's brother, Jermall Charlo's upcoming fight with Brian Castaño and how Jermall is showing a lot more moxie than Jamal is because at least Jamal is daring to be great. Taking on Brian Castaño, the WBO's junior middleweight champion for what is the undisputed crown at 154 pounds. I've seen a sentiment expressed in some circles, small ones, that the only reason that fight is happening is because both guys are on the same side of the street. And I do think that there is some truth to that. I do think there is some truth to Jermel being the beneficiary of a less political division at 154 than 160 pounds is. I think there is some truth to that. However, Jermel deserves full credit. Jermel deserves all the praise because he's actually choosing to go ahead with the fight. Understand that he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to vie to become an undisputed champion. He's doing it because he wants to. So yeah, Brian's on the same side of the street as him. And that does make the fight easier to make. Though ultimately, the fighter's gotta want the fight for there to be a fight. And Jermel wants that fight. Whereas his brother, Jamal, he doesn't. Never mind the Demetrius Andre situation. Never mind all of that. Because there is a guy on the same side of the street as Jamal that wants to fight him. And Jamal doesn't want nothing to do with him. Never mind crossing the street for Demetrius Andre or having Demetrius Andre cross the street for you. Never mind all of that. Because there is a guy on your same side of the street that wants to fight you. And you caught that guy out. And when push came to shove... You backed down. Kept looking for reasons for it not to happen. Kept looking for reasons to stay where he is. Says he wants to unify the middleweight division. Well, here we have a middleweight champion that's willing to fight you. And if you don't want to come to him, he's willing to come to you and you don't want to do it. You don't want to deal with fighters that fight on different platforms under different promotional banners. Guess what? You don't have to. Your stablemate wants to fight you and you don't want nothing to do with him either. Essentially what I'm getting at is... Jermel Charlo exhibits a lot more independence than Jermel Charlo. Jermel Charlo exhibits a lot more decisiveness than Jamal Charlo. That these two guys, they might be twin brothers, but they're very different people, as one of them exhibits a lot more focus and a lot more maturity than the other. Oh. You see Jamal, you listen to Jamal, you know what he wants, you know why he wants it. Whereas you listen to Jamal, you don't know if this guy's coming or going. You don't know if he wants to fight Demetrius Andre or he doesn't want to fight Demetrius Andre. Though if actions do speak louder than words, actions or the lack thereof, then it's clear 
Jamal doesn't want to fight anybody. He doesn't want Demetrius. He doesn't want David. He's quite content name-dropping fighters that he knows are preoccupied. Fighters that he knows are doing other things with other people. I mean, what are you supposed to say to that? Is this the part where I'm supposed to bring up that Demetrius pulled out on Jermel Charlo? A newsflash. We're not talking about Jermel Charlo. We're talking about Jermel Charlo. It's his excuse. In junior welterweight news, Regis Prograrius, former world champion Regis Prograrius, said, I can fucking guarantee you that Tank won't fight me. Here we go again. Tank ain't gonna come nowhere close to me. I can fucking guarantee you that Tank ain't gonna fight me, bro, because I'm gonna beat his ass. I'm gonna fuck him up. That's why. It ain't no personal beef. I don't even know Tank. I don't know him personally or nothing like that. It's boxing beef, you know? So I think I can fuck him up. He thinks he can fuck me up. So let's see what he does with Mario Barrios first. I've been hearing my name fucking thrown everywhere right now. They were saying Adrian Broner, they said Mikey Garcia, Bob Arum said something about me and Crawford. So I think realistically, it's probably me and Mikey Garcia. Me and Crawford probably won't happen because I'm not going to 147 pounds right now. I'm staying at 40 right now. I want a belt at 40 again. Adrian Broner don't want no parts of me. So Mikey Garcia said he wants to fight. I want to fight. I talked to Robert Garcia's brother. He said he is interested in the fight. So maybe Mikey Garcia might be next and i like that fight i really do at 140 pounds for what could be a newly vacated world title once josh taylor moves up after the jack catterall fight the jack catterall mandated title defense assuming josh moves up because we really don't know this is the sport of boxing where the news is fluid and ever-changing. Better still, I could go for Regis Prograrius versus Mikey Garcia. The issue is that Mikey hasn't fought in well over 12 months. Been inactive about 15, 16 months. 16 once we're all done with the month of June. That's right. It's been well over a year since Mikey Garcia's welterweight contest against Jesse Vargas. And while I very much like the idea of a Regis Prograrius fight at 140 pounds as opposed to 147. Ultimately, I don't think Mikey's gonna fight a guy like Regis, a dangerous guy, strong punching guy, good boxing acumen, good counter punching guy. I don't think he fights a guy like that off of 15 months of inactivity. No. There are a lot of different fights out there from Mikey Garcia between 140 and 147 pounds, but the interesting ones, those interesting fights are contingent on Mikey's ring return, and we don't know when that's going to be. Regis Prograrius has fought in the last 12 months. Mikey Garcia hasn't. Regis Prograrius has fought at least two times in the last 12 months. Once in October of last year, and more recently in April of this year against Ivan Redcatch. 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 I mean, if Mikey Garcia Redcatch. wants to fight Regis Prograrius straight away off of 15 months of inactivity, that's his prerogative. I'm just telling you, I don't view that scenario as being very likely because it's ill-advised. Regis is sharp. Mikey isn't. Regis has fought in the last 12 months at least two times. Mikey hasn't fought at all. I like the fight. I just don't know how likely it is. Because of Mikey Garcia's inactivity and because, you know, Javante Davis, he's set to make his junior welterweight debut this weekend against Mario Barrios. And what you have to ask yourself is, if you're Mikey Garcia, which one of those fights gets you more money? Which one of those potential opponent options? Now that Javante Davis is set to be campaigning as a junior welterweight, which one of those fights gets you more money? A Regis Prograrius fight at 140 pounds or a Javante Davis fight oh. at 140 pounds? Which one of those fights gets you more money? And which one of those fights is more risky? I'd say, comparatively, given what Regis has shown us so far, he is a very risky guy, even for Mikey Garcia. Regis can fight. Whose body of work at 140 pounds was never all that extensive to begin with. I'd say Regis is more of a risk to Mikey Garcia than Gervonta Davis would be even if he makes it through the Mario Barrios fight because Mario Barrios, God bless him, hasn't made much of a splash at 140 pounds. Even if Gervonta beats that guy, it ain't saying much. I was thinking about how they're handling Gervonta Davis's career, how they've been handling it, 
and how, you know, he probably can't make 130 pounds these days as easily as he could before. He's busting at the seams. Weight's too hard to make. The lightweight division, the 135-pound division, that division's too political. Devin Haney on the matchroom side of things. Ryan Garcia over there at Golden Boy. Vasil Lomachenko still floating around. Who knows what's going to happen with him in that Masayoshi Nakatani fight. Teofimo Lopez, he's got all the belts. There are no vacant titles for Javon to, to win. So they send him up there to 140. Oh. And you know, I was just thinking to myself, and all my wisdom, I says, I says, how long can they keep doing this for Javante Davis? How long can they continue to isolate him from entire divisions, entire weight classes? And then I thought about what might happen beyond the Barrios fight if Javante Davis wins. What then? A viable option for Javante Davis in that scenario would be, could be, a Mikey Garcia pay-per-view at 140 pounds. Because at some point, they're going to have to put him in there with somebody. There's a lot of shooters at 140 pounds, a lot of high-risk, low-reward guys. But the only guy at or around that weight that can get you some money, that's Mikey Garcia. Regis is too risky for the both of them. That is, Regis is a high-risk, low-reward kind of guy because he doesn't have the same marquee value as either of these fighters and he's not a world champion he's not in possession of a world title at this weight thus there's not much of an incentive for either javante davis or mikey garcia to fight regis prograrius i mean i'd like to see those fucking fights any way you match them up but i'm a degenerate boxing fan oh. ultimately what these guys are doing and how they're navigating their careers is in the best interests of maximizing their earning potential. And they stand a better chance of making more money with each other than either of them could with Regis Prograrius. In a nutshell, when Regis Prograrius says that he doesn't expect to fight Javante Davis, that Javante will never fight him, I happen to agree. Javante won't. Why would he fight Regis when he can make more money? With Mikey. I'm not saying talks have started for a fight like that. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that I'd sooner expect Javanta and Mikey to fight each other before either of them would fight Regis Prograrius. Finally, per a tweet from Michael Benson, some of you might have heard KSI has partnered with Wasserman Boxing and will be working with Kayla Nisei Solon, plus his management, Proper Loud, to launch his own boxing promotional company, oh. with the aim being to stage the world's biggest and best celebrity crossover boxing events. Kel Sarlin was recently quoted as saying, don't take this as boxing. I mean, these are YouTubers. I feel I'd smash them up. I'm not exactly taking this seriously and thinking that this will destroy the sport of boxing. If I hear anyone say that, we'll have a real debate because that's rubbish. You get the sense that boxing is selling its own soul. You know, Eddie Hearn, he promoted one of those influencer boxing matches involving the Paul brothers or one of the Paul brothers, I forget. I didn't partake in it myself. Here we see that European-based promoters, Kayla Nisei Sarland, Wasserman Boxing, they're going to be promoting KSI's events moving forward to promote celebrity boxing matches in that region of the world. Up until recently, most of those celebrity crossover fights have been happening on the North American continent, whereas now some of them are set to arrive in the United Kingdom, and you start to wonder if boxing is selling its own soul. Maybe. One minute, you've got Josh Taylor bashing these wannabe boxers and influencers for what they're doing. The next minute, he's taking selfies with them. For some weeks now, reigning cruiserweight champion, Ring Magazine, IBF champion, Mavis Breedis, has been vigorously calling out Jake Paul. Jesus. It's cringeworthy. The boxing world can't seem to come to a consensus, and... Make up its mind how it really feels about these YouTubers and these TikTokers and influencers invading their world. To some capacity, they are. Boxing world can't seem to make up its mind how it really feels about this. And perhaps it's easy for these influencers and YouTubers and, and social media personalities, perhaps it's easy for them to infiltrate the sport of boxing as opposed to other sports. Because in the sport of boxing, unlike some other sports, all manner of chicanery is allowed in pursuit of the almighty dollar. Rules are bent, rules are broken, and it's all in the name of turning over a profit. So when they see they can turn over a profit with these non-boxers, these wannabes... Well, that's what they decide to do. You know that boxing isn't like other sports. Other sports 
are structure more stringent when it comes to their protocols and their rules and and you know you don't get to play for the nba just because you got a couple followers on instagram you don't get to join the mlb the nfl or the nhl just because you've got a big social media following it doesn't work like that whereas in boxing you can apply for a boxing license with a local commission and i'll give you one bada bing bada boom you're a fucking boxer and because many of these influencers already have sizable followings hence them being influencers, their events, however irreverent, however silly, garner a level of attention that an actual professional boxer that has put in the work, put in the sweat, put in the blood. Blood. These influencers might get more attention than someone like that. And, and I reiterate, you do have to wonder if boxing is selling its own soul in pursuit of the almighty dollar. It's easier to do this in the sport of boxing because the sport of boxing oftentimes doesn't respect its own rules involving actual boxers. Thus, it's that much easier to infiltrate because it's lacking structure. I don't know how detrimental this is or isn't to the sport of boxing because I don't know that boxing shares an audience with KSI or Logan, Jake Paul, TikTokers versus YouTubers. I don't know that these events are actually taking away from the sport of boxing because I don't know that boxing shares an audience with these events, with these people. Maybe it's apples and oranges. Because reportedly a million people, at least a million, bought that Mayweather versus Paul pay-per-view and I wasn't one of them, were you? Did you guys buy it? Because I know I didn't. And in that way, I don't know that boxing actually shares an audience with these social media influencers. And if it doesn't, then it's no detriment to the sport when these kids decide to do whatever the fuck they're doing. I don't know that this actually hurts the sport. Maybe what it really hurts are the fighters' egos that wannabe boxers have bigger followings than real ones do.